Baiju's 9th and 10th grade channel. I'm your teacher Aishwarya and in this particular video, we are going to be looking at the chapter Forest and Wildlife Resources and we will be doing the full chapter explanation in one shot. So I hope all of you are excited for this video and if you are, do not forget to hit the like button on this video. Now if you are very new and this is the first video that you are seeing of our channel, I welcome you to our beautiful Baiju's 9th and 10th grade channel. Now of course we are a family where we believe that teaching our students with utmost conceptual clarity is our number one priority. So if you enjoy and you completely understand the chapter explanation, do not forget to hit the subscribe button on the channel for more such interesting videos. So without wasting any more time, we will get started. Now what are the learning objectives from this chapter? Or simply put, what are we going to learn in our class today? So first and foremost, we will be learning about the forest and wildlife resources and we will also talk about how these resources are interdependent on each other. Now we'll briefly understand how over a period of time they have been subjected to certain degradation. And then we will focus our energy into understanding how there have been implementation to conservation and what are the conservation strategies that were taken up. Now, of course, we will also shed some light on understanding the importance of communities in conservation as well. And we will talk about certain projects that were implemented on conservation. So now, of course, this, this explanation that will be there in today's video is as per the rationalized syllabus. So keeping that in mind, please note that there is no map work coming from this particular chapter. So students, without wasting any more time now, we will jump right into understanding the chapter. Now, of course, when we talk about forest and wildlife, right? When you think about forests, the first thing, the first picture that flashes into our mind is a big field or a big area that is covered with trees, that's covered with plants, shrubs and various other small natural vegetation. And when I say wildlife, you immediately think about animals, right? You think about animals, you think about birds that are there and various insects. Now, if you look at our beautiful planet Earth, we don't just find one type of living organism, not one animal, one plant, one tree, not in that case, right? But rather, we see that there are so many different kinds of it. Or I would say that there is a variety of living organisms that we find on Earth. There are millions and millions of organisms and they make up our biodiversity. So if you see biodiversity or biological diversity, it can be simply referred to as the variety of life and we see that all of them right although however different or however diverse that they are they all are closely integrated in a system through various ways or various interdependencies right so this is a very technical definition that is there in your textbook but now we will understand what are these interdependencies that i am talking about now let's take the example of a forest, right? Now in a, in a forest itself, we see that there are so many different kinds of living organisms. There are plants, there are animals, there are birds, there are microorganisms, right? And they're all, what do you say, they're all different from each other. But yet we see that they form a complex web where they're all interdependent on each other. So how are they interdependent on each other? Well, we know that the plants that are there, they take up the nutrients from the soil and they take up carbon dioxide from the air and they make food, right? And we know that this food that is there is necessary for them to survive. But at the same time, we also see that plants are also food for other living organisms. So you have herb herbivores that feed only on plants, but we see that other animals that are there, right? There are other animals which feed on animals as well. So in this particular case, if you see nutrients of food, that is there, food contains nutrients and nutrients flow from one living organism to another. So there is a flow of energy. And this relationship that is there is what we understand as food chain. We've been learning about this right from our lower grades as well. Now, of course, it is not that in, say, a certain place. Let's consider the forest itself, right? In a forest, not that there is going to be one food chain, but rather there are going to be multiple food chains. In some cases, they will overlap with each other, which means that they form a complex system called as food web. Yes, and we know that there are multiple food webs that are there. Now, we know that in a food web, if it's, if it's a complicated or a complex food web, if one living organism gets affected, then the whole complex network, right? The whole chain that is there will collapse, which means that in a certain space or what I will use as in an ecological system. 
Now you will find this word in your textbook as well. Don't get comp don't get worried about it. When you say an ecological system, it means that an ecosystem, an eco space or an ecosystem wherein you find different living organisms and they're in how they are interdependent on each other for food, right? So here it's not just food is one aspect of it, but we also know that shelter could be another aspect, right? So in this case, when I say in an ecological system, living organisms are interdependent on each other. This is what we mean. Right now we see that in an ecological system balance needs to be maintained and now we have understood why because there are multiple food chains multiple food webs and if one living organism is affected severely it will disrupt the balance that is there. So when you look at forests right and it's because this particular chapter de uh, you know de uh, dwells deep with respect to forests we see that forests that are there are home to almost 80% of the world's animals right land animals especially and of course it also includes a lot of plants as well and covers 31% of the total land area that is there. And we see that forests play a very important role in ecological systems, right? Because if you see the large population of forests that are there include your trees and your plants, which are nothing but your producers, right? And we know that living organisms, especially other animals and organisms are dependent on these plants. So we see that forests have a key role. And they are diverse in the kind of flora and fauna that we find. Flora is basically all your plant organisms. Fauna include your animals, right? So rich variety of plants and animals. But over a period of time, right, we know especially over a period of time, I'm talking about maybe the last 50 years or maybe a little before that as well, we know that the number or the population of these animals have been getting affected. Or you can say that the species are dwindling. Now the word dwindling means that their numbers are decreasing. And what could be the aspects? This is also something that we are very familiar with. We know that over a period of time, there have been a lot of activities which has contributed towards this. Overpopulation is one of the biggest factors, right? Because when there is over, when the number or the population has increased exponentially, there has been an increase in demand for resources, right? There is increase in demand for land with respect to housing, which is why various habitats, various natural habitats have been destroyed or space has been cleared through deforestation, wherein we see that as a result, there has been loss of habitats for so many animals. Now, along with that, we see that hunting and poaching has also taken place rapidly. Now, of course, back in the early men days, right, in the early days, we saw that people were hunting because that is the way they were fending for themselves, right? They were able to feed or eat or get food, yes? But now after, let's say, uh, maybe during uh, much, much later, we saw that hunting was a uh, recreational activity, something where they would do to spend their time, right? But over a period of time, that escalated and a lot of illegal hunting started to take place and the number of or population of animals started to decrease drastically. So we see that this right here has also been a factor which has contributed to the number of species de uh, declining or you could simply say causing loss of biodiversity. Now, along with this, we also see that pollution has contributed towards it, where the natural resources have been polluted, forest fires, right? Forest fires due to climate change or various other reasons. We see that forest fires have also caused destruction of habitat, resulting in loss of biodiversity. And in some cases, we also see that poisoning has also contributed. So, now we see that there has been a loss or a severe loss of biodiversity. And we have just learned that an ecological system needs that balance. Otherwise, we know that it is going to, if that disruption happens, there could be a large impact. Which is where we see that there is a need for conservation. So what is conservation? Conservation is the practice of caring for the resources so that all living organisms that are there are, can benefit from them now and even in the future. So we are not just thinking about our now. We are also thinking about our future and how this is going to help. But again, if they ask you a question, why is it necessary to conserve forest and wildlife resources? 
if you get this question, say for two marks, what are the two points that you are going to write? Conservation is necessary because it maintains your ecological diversity, right? Now, why is ecological diversity necessary? Because it also supports various life systems, water, soil, all of that, right? So we see that this right here is imp important. Now, along with this, if you talk about a lot of modern things that we require, say agriculture, or let's talk about fisheries, right? In all of these cases, these are the examples that are given. We see that they are also dependent on the natural ecological diversity, right? For agriculture, you require the traditional varieties. Or for fisheries that are there, we see that aquatic biodiversity is necessary. Which is why in this case, conservation is important. Which is why in the early 1960s and 70s, there was a lot of pressure to implement such programs. And that is where the Indian Wildlife Protection Act was implemented in 1972. That was focused on protecting the habitats and wildlife. Now, what was the main intent? So, this was an official act which was proposed. And what was the main intent of it? So, this can come as a short note as well. And the date is also important because it can come for an MCQ. Yes? So, what was the main intent? The main intent was to make sure that so far, the population has been affected, right? The, the biodiversity has been affected due to the various factors that we have discussed. Now, we should not allow that to continue, right? We have to put a stop somewhere, yes? Which is why the main intent was to take care and protect the remaining population of endangered species. Now, what are endangered species? Endangered species are those species or those living organisms wherein the number has come to, the, the population has come to a drastic low and there is a potential that they could no longer exist on the planet or they could become extinct, right? So, that is what we understand as endangered species in very simple terms, right? And one of the main intents was to also put a ban on hunting, right? Now, of course, over a period of time, especially most recently, we see that is, uh, in the case of, you know, Asia, uh, in the case of Asiatic um, elephants, snow leopards, and of course, in the great, uh, the great Indian bustard, we see that almost legal protection has been provided where full or partial protection has been there on hunting and trade throughout India. So, severe steps have been taken towards making sure that certain species of animals are protected. Now, along with that, we also see that the government has implemented protected areas, right? So, we see that they have implemented protected areas. Now, apart from just saying that, hey, there's a ban on hunting, you cannot ban, you cannot hunt this animal, right? We also see that they have established areas which are protected, right? And the natural habitat is maintained in such areas. So, that is where your national parks and wildlife sanctuaries come into the picture in order to protect the wildlife and forest cover. So, some examples that are there are, of course, Kanha National Park and, of course, we see that Narayan Sarovar Sanctuary. These are all some examples that are there and I'm sure that from whichever state you are from, there will be an example of National Park that you will, or Wildlife Sanctuary that you will be able to give me. But it's important to understand the difference between a National Park and a Wildlife Sanctuary because they are not exactly the same, right? Both of them are protected areas, but what they aim towards protecting is slightly different. Now, when you talk about a wildlife sanctuary, right, as the name suggests, wildlife. So, the main intent of a wildlife sanctuary is to protect the wildlife of that particular area. And they want to protect it in their natural habitat, right? So, the focus is on conserving those animal species that are there and making sure that they are protected from any sort of disturbance. So, when I say disturbance, we're talking about hunting activities, poaching that is there, capturing them, right? So, all of that is strictly prohibited in such areas and strict actions can be taken place if anybody violates these laws, right? So, the focus here is to protect the wild animals in their natural habitat. While on the other hand, in the case of a national park, right, the intent of a national park is to make sure or the aim is to protect the natural environment. It is all the living organisms, your wildlife species as well as your plant species also, right? Whatever is there, all species in that protected area will be conserved. And we see that however the flora and fauna is, it is maintained or present in their natural state. So, that is where, or you should understand, so when we say that these are the laws which are proposed by the government, you need to understand what do we mean by a protected area, what is a wildlife sanctuary, what is a national park. Examples are going to be important in this particular case. And over a period of time, we also see that there have been various projects 
so in some cases with respect to specific animals also we see that various wildlife protection projects were taken place in order to protect threatened species right so tigers one horn rhinos black buck we also see that various projects were taken up now these are some examples but of course an example that has been elaborated in great detail in your textbook is project tiger right now project tiger is something which is very very special right because if you see tiger that is there one of is one among the majestic animals right and over a period of time what was observed in the, in about 1970s is that there has been a serious threat to the tiger population so earlier we saw that the population was around 55000 and it decreased it fell down from 55000 all the way to 8827 just take a minute to understand how much of a decrease has taken place from 55000 to just 1000 number of tigers right we're talking about all over and we see that there were major threats towards tiger population right so what were the major threats that were there first and foremost poaching right poaching for trade was happening yes and we also know that growing human population was there tiger skin and their bones this was of great demand and at that point we saw that especially in asian countries we saw that the number or there was a large decrease in the tiger population because of this very reason right so we see that poaching for trade mainly for their skin bones these were all one of the major causes and over a period of time especially in regions like india and nepal we saw that there was a surviving tiger population and they understood that see if two thirds of the surviving tiger population was in india and nepal there had to be serious steps that had to be taken place otherwise these tigers will become another target right so now if the population elsewhere has decreased now next they will come here to get rid of these tigers or hunt them down illegally yes which is why serious steps have to be taken place and that is when and project tiger was implemented now project tiger was a wildlife campaign which was launched in the year 1973 now the main aim was it was not just focused on saving or conserving the tigers right but it was an effort made towards saving endangered species in general right they had to especially for conservationists right it is very important that even raising awareness towards the larger masses was important which is why it was a campaign all throughout that was done in order to protect them and we saw that over a period of time in various national parks this was implemented right which were all in india itself we see that there are various national parks which have which act as tiger reserves so we saw that earlier right so going back to the numbers we saw that it had come down all the way to 1827 but over a period of time through these campaigns we see that in india so this is the numbers that we are talking in india right so 1800 was all over the world right but over a period of time from 2006 we see that the numbers increased from 1400 all the way to 2967 tigers in 2018 and as of july 2023 right 29th july is all is celebrated as global tiger day and on this particular day in 2023 it was um, it was uh, explicitly mentioned that about 3925 tigers is the tiger population in our country so we have made a successful campaign in conserving the tiger population and this is a proud moment for all of us when it comes to the field of conservation So now we understand the importance of these conservation strategies and having certain rules which are implemented. Now over a period of time, right? Say post nineteen after say nineteen seventy three, closer towards the nineteen eighties, they started realizing that it was not just certain wildlife animals, but even insects were added. Right? Insects were also getting subjected to loss because of loss of habitat. Their numbers were coming down. Now you must be thinking, "Arey, ma'am." why is insect so important i mean okay tiger i can understand maybe some animals i can understand but why are you talking about insects how do they matter at all there are so many of them anyway if some few go away doesn't really matter right so what was the focus of putting our eyes in conserving insects now let's understand that insects that are there they form the base right so we see that most often we overestimate right or we overstate their importance but rather we see that they form the base of various food webs right 
So when you talk about various animals, we see that insects are food for those animals. Now their population is decreasing, food for various other animals in a habitat are decreasing, that again disrupts ecological balance, right? So we see that apart from it just being food, they are also very important with respect to pollination. We know that insects play a key role in pol act as pollinating agents. Now along with that, various worms and everything that are there, they, hel uh, they help in aerating the soil as well, right? So there are various things in which they are involved, right? So insects and various other organisms have various roles to play. It might be a small role, but a very important role, right? Which is why we also see that there were there were steps taken towards conserving and protecting such insects also. And later, closer to 1991, in these protection acts, plants and various other organisms were slowly getting added. So from this, we understand the importance of conservation, right? And the steps taken towards it. Now, they can ask you in your examination that what was the main intent of the uh, protection, Act, you know, the Wildlife Protection Act that was there. So they can ask you some questions based on that. So please keep a note of it. Now, let's move on to understanding a little more about forest resources, right? So now we've understood why it is important to conserve. Yes. Now, even though if you want to conserve also, you have to conserving is not just saying that I will conserve and that's the end of it, right? Just establishing a protected area and you are done. No, active steps have to be taken, it needs to get regulated, right? So who is going to do all of this? It is going to be your forest department and there are various other departments that are involved in it. Now broadly, in order to regulate, we see that they have been divided, right? So the government has classified forests into three categories. You have your reserve forest, your protected forest and unclassed forest. Now students, please, please take a minute because this topic right here is very, very important. You can get MCQ based questions. You can get two mark questions as well where they'll ask you to differentiate between either of the two. So please star mark this particular question, this particular topic especially. So let's understand what are reserve forests, right? Now reserve forests that are there take up more than half of India's total forest land. And they are owned by the government, they are protected by the government, right? And what is the intent of it? We see that the main intent that is there to, is to conserve forest and wildlife resources. Now apart from this, we also see that in this particular case, right, activities in a protect, reserved forest is limited, right, which means that local people are not really allowed in the uh, reserved areas of the forest and we see that if at all they have to go, off, if they need to do something there, then they need to take special permission, right, so they need to take special permission from say a forest officer and only then they will be allowed to go there. So in regions like Jammu Kashmir, Andhra Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Kerala, so I will just mark Kerala because in the map right here Kerala is not marked, so I'm really sorry about that. Kerala, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal and in all these regions we see that reserve forests are present. So out of this you just need to maybe know about two to three examples, well and good, you don't need to remember all of it, right? So this is what we understand as reserved forests. Now on the other hand you have protected forests. Now, protected forests that are there make up one third of total India's forest area. And it is again declared as protected by the forest department. Now, this is monitored or it is administered by the government. And the main intent is to make sure that they are protected from further depletion. That means maybe earlier some depletion or some activities have contributed towards the wildlife and forest resources getting affected. But now they are classified as protected so that further we see that nothing happens, right? Now here again we see that with respect to control. So we see that power has been established such that maybe certain activities can be controlled but again it needs to be monitored by the government, right? Certain activities. Now again Bihar, Haryana, Punjab, Himachal Pradesh, Odisha, Rajasthan, Rajasthan have a bulk of the areas that come under your protected forest. And we see that uh, an area which has both reserved and protected forests are together known as permanent forests. So Madhya Pradesh that is there has the largest area under permanent forest which contributes towards 75% of its total area. So now you have reserved, protected and permanent, right? Important to remember these three. What are you left with? You are left with last one that is there, which is going to be your unclassed forests, right? Now, your unclassed, so I'm just going to write this at the bottom. 
Now your unclassed forest that is there is the remaining forest land, right? Which does not come under this category of reserved and protected, right? And we see that this is not just owned by the government, but individuals and communities are also there. So we see that in this particular case, the village communities also have a right over this. Now, especially in the northeastern sta states and in parts of Gujarat, we find a large area, right? Large area of unclassed forests that are there. So broadly, if you see on your board examination point of view, you need to know the broad differences between these three categories. Now understand that forests can be classified in different ways, right? There are various ways in categorizing forests. Now here we have understood one way of categorizing forests based on how it is governed and how it is administered and who takes care of it, right? So this is one way of classifying forests, but we know that there are multiple ways of classifying forests. So with this, of course, we have understood the importance or how various conservation strategies have been taken place by the government. But it's not just the government that is involved in conservation strategies. Indian communities are also actively involved in conservation, right? Because if you see, well, let's go back to the Indian history. Many of us or many communities that were there were interdependent on the forests, right? And we also know that it is home to a lot of traditional communities, which is why we see that these communities take an active role in taking steps towards conservation. Now, when we talk about communities getting involved in conservation, we know that the first obvious movement that comes into our mind is of course the Chipko movement that took place, right? Now we know that the Chipko movement that was there of course originated in the Himalayan region and of course we know that environmentalists like Sundarlal Bahuguna went on talking about the Chipko movement to various other villagers so that it could be taken up. And this was mainly involving rural villagers like women that promoted to protect trees. They would go and they would hug the trees or they would stick towards the trees to prevent deforestation from happening. And thereby, as a community, they wanted to promote afforestation. Now, these were attempts that were, you know, slowly promoting traditional ways of reviving and developing more methods, right, to make sure that more num it was not subjected towards deforestation. So, Chipko movement was very, very popular. Now, of course, apart from that, we also see that in various cases, villagers have actively taken steps towards conserving, you know, conserving forest areas, right? So, another example that was there was in the Alwar district, where villagers themselves went and they ensured that they would protect habitats and they would explicitly reject the involvement of the government. So, one such example is in Rajasthan in the Alwar district, where about 1,200 1, acres of forest was discovered. Uh, was declared as the Bhairo Dev, uh, Bhairo Dev Dhakav Sanchuri, right? And they have put their own rules and regulations there that does not allow any hunting to happen. It, it ensures that there is protection against wildlife and they will prevent any encroachment, right? Encroachment is basically if anybody tries to illegally enter, right, or encroach. So here we see that they themselves have taken it. They don't want the help of the government. They have decided what they want to do. So this right here is an important example that you will have to remember. Now, apart from that, a very popular movement that was there again was the Beach Bachao Andolan that was there in Uttarakhand, right? And here, the intent was slightly different, right? Although earlier we were talking about forest and wildlife resources and protection of forest and wildlife, this was slightly different where we were more promoting indigenous varieties, right? So what are indigenous varieties? Varieties that originate from our country itself, right? Now, why are indigenous varieties very important or native seed varieties very important? Now, here, if you talk about it, beej bachao, that means save the seed, right? So we're talking about preserving native seeds or natural varieties that are originated from our country, right? So we call them as native seeds. And promoting this would also mean that conserving or preserving the wildlife of our area. So normally what happens is that introduction of chemicals and all of that could alter the, you know, it could, it could have an impact on the na native seeds, which is why they wanted to preserve the varieties of plants as it is, which is where the Beach Bachao Andolan came into the picture. And this is a very, very important movement as well. Now, along with that, another very important movement or another very important place where community was involved was the Joint Forest Management. Now, the Joint Forest Management Program is very important, again, on an examination point of view because they could ask you a long answer question to elaborate on what is Joint Forest Management. Now, the Joint Forest Management was launched in 1988, which involves local communities in that area, 
right? So if this is an area and we want to conserve the trees in this area, the local communities would be involved along with the forest department or the forest management that is there. And together, it was not just the community alone or the forest department alone. They would work towards making sure that together they will be able to restore any degraded forests, right? So we see that this was formally, this came into the existence in the state of Odisha, which passed the first resolution for this, right? And of course, this was introduced, right? So the National Forest Policy was the first, right, which introduced, or this was the vehicle through which the concept was introduced by the Indian government. So what exactly happens here? Now, of course, in this particular case, we see that the local communities, right, they are given certain responsibilities where they are dependent or rather what you would say, they will take up, they will make sure that they protect the forest, maybe say from fire or from some grazing happening, right? So they will be involved in making sure that they help out the department by making sure that some illegal activities don't take place, right? So we see that protection activities or they, they undertake those protection activities. Now, in turn, what will they get? So, in turn of that, they will be getting some non-timber, right? So, there is a benefit for them as well. In return of doing this or in return of the communities getting involved, they will get some non-timber forest produce. Yes, so we will see that they will get some non-timber forest produce. Now, what do I mean by these non-timber forest produce? It mainly includes your medicinal plants, it includes fruits, certain dyes, right? So basically non-timber forest products that would be there. So these are some examples, yes? Now what are the advantages of doing this joint forest management? So first and foremost, we see that some of the advantages that there is increase in agricultural and forest produce. So now you are collaborating with the locals, right? So this allows or this allows for more amount of agriculture to take place, forest reproduction to happen. So more number of forest produce comes, comes into the picture because more number of people are getting involved. Now, at the same time, when local communities are actively getting involved in these protection activities, it also generates employment for them, which is also good for the country. Now, along with that, this puts a little reduction in the forest pressure, right? So, we see that apart from that, because it's going hand in hand, it's not putting a lot of pressure on the forest, right? And of course, the forest rights. At the end of the day, because it is working in collaboration, we see that some unwanted activities, right? So, illegal poaching or illegal uh, cutting down of trees, all of those won't happen because now the local communities are also kept in loop, right? So that's why joint forest management program is a very advantageous program as well, not just for the government, but also for the local communities that get involved. So just give me one minute because I've dropped my pen. Awesome. So with this, of course, we have understood how communities are involved. Now, the last one we will talk about is sacred groves, right? Now, sacred groves that are there, somehow becomes a very tricky topic to understand. But to be honest, it's a very easy topic, right? Now, if you talk about our country, especially our country, we see that nature worship is an age-old tribal belief that was there because we, at that time it was believed that all creations of nature has to be protected, right? Which is why we see that such beliefs have made sure that certain forests, virgin forests, so when we say virgin forests, those forests are as it is. There has been no modification made to it. These forests are in pristine condition, which we call as sacred groves, which we say as forests of God or goddesses. And these are patches of forests Forests which are untouched by local people. There is no interference, right? And if at all anybody wants to interfere, it is banned, right? So we see that there are certain communities which worship certain kind of trees, right? So if I have to give you some examples, so the santals of the uh, the santals that are there in the Chota Nagpur area, they would you know worship mahua trees and kadamba trees. So let me just write this down, Mahua and Kadamba trees, right? Similarly, there are certain tribals in Bihar that worship the tamarind tree, especially if I like, because, you know, normally all across we see that the banyan trees and the people trees, they're all considered to be sacred. And we often see that even certain qu sacred qualities are there, which we see, right? It could be 
often like in the mountain areas or maybe in some springs we see that there are a lot of sacred qualities which we see which is maintained as it is and in south india especially right if you see from kerala in the northern regions of kerala like in the kasargod district and in all those regions various carvers are there right hope i'm pronouncing it right there are various carvers which are also cons uh, ka carvers which are considered as important places wherein it's also considered as sacred groves and they are preserved as it is so in this particular case if you see through this case right we see that it's also considered as a space of worship a space of sacredness which is what we understand as sacred groves so with the students we come to an end where we have understood the entire chapter now like i said in this particular chapter conservation and conservation strategies are very very important so please do make a note of it and for that i will give you a homework question describe how communities have conserved and protected forest uh, forest and wildlife in india and i want you to just list it down i don't want you to describe it because that could be very big but you can list down the topics that we have discovered under which we have discussed and elaborated in great detail when we spoke about how communities are involved so i hope you found this particular class helpful for all of you if you did please let me know in the comments below and of course you know by just 9th and 10th grade channel has always got you covered so if you like this class do not forget to hit the subscribe button on our channel do not forget to like this video and share this video with all of your friends hoping to see you all soon again up until then take care lots of love and bye bye